Hello, good morning, and welcome to Nature Live Online from the Natural History Museum. I'm Khalil Thurloway. While our doors may be shut for the time being, we still want to provide you with an inside peek at the science and the people that make the museum what it is. In fact, we're reopening to the public from tomorrow, the 5th of August, and we're all really excited about it. We've put in a load of measures to make sure you can have a fun and safe time at the museum. And you can find out all the information on our website. Before we start the show, a little bit of context. We're running an exciting new project funded by the Natural Environment Research Council called Nature in Lockdown, a breath of fresh air. And we want to hear from you. The past few months in lockdown have confined most of us to our homes with pubs and restaurants closed, public transport stopping, and generally fewer humans out and about. What kind of effect could this have had on the plants and animals in the UK? What are you curious about? Visit our website and click on the Anthropocene tab in the top left to take part in our quick five question survey to tell us what you want to know about the impacts of lockdown on nature. We'll also be running a photo competition and we're looking for your images of nature during lockdown. And details will be available in the same place as the survey. Now, today, we're gonna to be finding out about plastic pollution and what effect the lockdown might be having on it. To show us the ropes, we've got Alex McGoran, who studies plastic pollution at the museum. Hey Alex, thanks for joining us. Hi. <laughs> And we'd love to hear from you guys at home as well. So if you've got any questions today, please do pop them in the comments section and we'll try and answer as many as we can in the time we've got. So Alex, before we get into the nitty gritty of plastic pollution, why don't you give us a bit of an introduction to yourself and what you do at the museum? So I'm a PhD student here at the Natural History Museum and at Royal Holloway University of London. And I look at microplastics in the Thames food web. So that's everything from the smallest animals at the bottom of the food chain. So really small crustaceans, shrimp, all the way up to fish and to their predators, which would be seals and porpoises in the Thames. And so uh, before we get into the discussion of plastic pollution, why don't you give us a bit of a background into what plastic pollution is and what kind of effects it can have on the environment, just so that we're all starting from the same place? Obviously, I think most of us are aware now that plastic is quite a big problem. It's, it's a global problem. It affects everywhere on the planet and pretty much every environment. It's, it's in the air around us. It, it can fall in snow and in rain. It's in the sediment. It's on, on Earth, like on the, the terrestrial environment. And it's also in the ocean and our rivers. So that could be anything from large pieces of litter like these or even to micro or to nanoplastics, so really tiny particles that can entangle wildlife, they can be ingested by wildlife. So all of these plastics affect the environment in different ways. So you mentioned nano and microplastics. So what kind of size ranges are we looking at? So micro is anything smaller than five millimeters. So that's an example of micro here. So this is a grain of rice, about seven millimetres, and a, a blue film that we took from one of a, a fish that we studied, and that's three millimetres. So in terms of microplastics, that's large, um, but nanoplastics would be a thousandth of a millimetre, so incredibly small pieces of plastic, and these are, are small enough where they can start moving between cells and can therefore have completely different negative effects to, to what microplastics can do. So the same material, but in different forms, can have radically different effects on, on the environment and the organisms in it. And yeah, your certainly. Is mostly on the Thames, right? So what kind, of, uh, what kind of environment are we looking at in the Thames and how, what kind of relationship does plastic pollution have uh, with the Thames? So the Thames is, um, the reason we look at rivers for a start is because although we all think of plastic as out in the ocean, it's that sort of almost far away problem. 80% of what is in, in the ocean started its life on land. So like in this image, it could go down a drain or you know, it could run off from landfill or come from other sort of land-based sources. But how it gets there is from rivers. So the River Thames is a really important pathway for how plastic in, in Reading, in, in London, can move from those cities out into the ocean and therefore move all around the world. And we look at it as well because it's an incredibly rich river. It's full of life. In the 50s, it was devoid of life. It had nothing living in it, and that was due to chemical pollution. But since we've cleaned up the river, we've got 125 species of fish in the estuary alone. So that's not including any of the freshwater species. That's just those that can live in the saltwater environment, plus crabs and shrimp, seals and porpoises. 
So it's really healthy and that's why we want to know what impact plastic has before it gets out to sea and what it does to these animals. Yeah, because I guess that uh, brings up a point about how we think of plastic and, and litter and stuff because, you know, as soon as it's out of sight, so we saw in that image of a, of a drain, you know, uh, as soon as that litter either goes in the bin or goes down the drain, we assume that it's just gone and it stops existing. But actually, it still has this really long lifespan and, and can go on a, a journey that we didn't intend or didn't predict. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's not always just littering. It can be that it runs off from a place where we put it. So like landfill can leach plastic. There can be rain or or um, wind that would blow it into the river. So sometimes even when we're being well-intentioned or putting it where it's supposed to go or where we put it, there can still be a leak into the environment and from there it can travel, you know, like I say, around the world. So you mentioned the biodiversity of the Thames. Um, so uh, what sort of uh, interactions do we get when this plastic enters the, the river ecosystem? So we're looking at um, what I'm looking at specifically is this trophic transfer, which means movement from prey to predators. And it's really well sort of documented in uh, chemical pesticides. So DDT, for example, was a pesticide sprayed on crops. Insects would have a small amount and that would uh, sort of kill those insects and then small birds would eat those. And it would sort of move through the food chain in ever growing concentrations until it had a really devastating effect at the top. So what we want to look at is if we look at the small invertebrates, so those that you can see sort of in the middle here, the, the worm, the little crustacean, the little shrimp and the, and the bivalve and, and snail, if they eat a small amount of plastic and then the fish and the crabs eat several of those to have slightly more plastic, if a seal eats several fish, is it going to have a lot more plastic than was sort of at the base of the food web at those really early stages? And that's what we're sort of trying to unpick now with this research. I guess, yeah, there's that risk of kind of accumulation of plastic. Does that mean that if we as humans eat a fish or a crab that has been exposed to plastic pollution, does that mean we're then ingesting a lot of plastic ourselves? So it's a bit of a, a tricky question because it sort of implies that the only place we get plastic is from the food that we eat and from our, our seafood. But plastic is in tap water, it's in bottled drinks, it's pretty much everywhere. We surround ourselves with plastic, our clothes, curtains, carpets, it's all made of plastic so there's fibers in the air around us um so there was a study that showed that in the time it would take you to eat a plate of mussels an animal that we eat whole so we're not removing the digestive system and therefore removing the plastic more plastic more fibers would have fallen on it in the time it took you to eat that plate than were ever in those mussels to begin with so yes we're eating plastics but it's not a case that our seafood is the place that it's coming from and that we should stop eating shellfish for instance um because we'd still be inhaling and eating plastic anyway and do we know what sorts of effects plastic can have on whether it's the animals in the in the wild or whether it's on us so it's quite hard to say in humans at present what effect it has but what we can do is do lab studies with animals and sort of have if it does this to the animals what could it be doing to us um, so a lot of this is done with uh, invertebrates in labs, so worms and, and things like that. And these worms have reduced feeding activities. They don't want to feed as much, which will obviously mean that they have less energy. Plastics can also, even in a high enough dose, can be lethal, uh, but also have chemicals in them that are what we call endocrine disrupting. So they mimic hormones. So if you're a male and you've got a, a chemical that acts like a female hormone, it might mean that you're less successful when you come to reproduce. Um, and also we've got um, cancer causing uh, chemicals that are associated with plastic. So obviously that would have a very serious health impact. Um, at present concentrations, it's not typically lethal to animals. Uh, it can be in some cases, but it's not sort of, you know, there's so much plastic that everything dies because it's eating it. Um, but in general, if you're healing all of these different types of damage, this physical damage, this chemical damage, you have a lot less energy to grow or to produce your offspring. So it could have this sort of knock on effect for the whole community. 
And those kind of, uh, it's funny that you mentioned those hormone mimicking chemicals, because I think one that's had a little bit of publicity over the past few years, some of our viewers might have heard of it, is BPA. I think it's bisphenol A or something. Um, and that's a chemical that goes into a lot of plastics to keep them flexible or something. Uh, yeah, that's so that's what we say is plastic pollution isn't plastic pollution, which isn't plastic pollution, because one type of plastic can have, you know, it can be a different polymer. It could be acrylic, it could be polyethylene, it could be nylon. But even in different iterations of acrylic, you could have an acrylic with a dye in it and that dye will be made of a certain chemical or it could have like you say a chemical like bpa that makes it flexible or something that makes it rigid and strong and so every plastic is completely different and then once it fragments you can get fragments or films or fibers or spheres and all of those will affect plastic and or affect animals in different ways as well so plastic is a really complicated pollutant because it's not just We've got one chemical, what does that one chemical do? And, okay, so before we go into the issues of uh, how the how kind of lockdown pandemic might have affected uh, the, the, uh, the relationship with plastic and the environment, let's go to a couple of questions from our viewers. Um, so Jessica has asked on YouTube, uh, do we know what the biggest lump of plastic that has been found in the Thames so far is? Uh, so a lot of the pollution in the Thames, it's not just plastic. So there's a lot of driftwood and stuff as well. So we have hit pieces of wood that were too big to bring onto the boat. They were wider than a, a vessel. So a lot of large pieces of wood. There's also um, lots of tyres. So rubber is sort of, it's not technically necessarily plastic, but it's a, another similar uh, pollutants. We've had at least four tyres, so if anybody wants a spare, you can scrape the barnacles off, but we've got some around. Um, I mean, if you've got four, you could fit a whole car. Yeah, just if anybody wants a barnacle encrusted car, come to the museum. We've got plenty of spares. And I guess There's a lot of the plastic one... pollution you find is also uh, kind of conglomerations of smaller bits, right? Yeah, so wet wipes, for instance, if you flush a wet wipe down the toilet, it doesn't go away. It doesn't magically get removed from that sewage system it can from there make its way into the thames and when they get into the environment they sort of slowly stretch and then act as a sort of net to catch sediment and vegetation and they can build up so uh this i think it's the south side of hammersmith bank is actually almost a completely artificial bank an artificial reef of wet wipes that in about four years have grown a meter in height there is it's about the size of three tennis courts, I believe. And it's almost entirely wet wipes and sediment just building up year on year. And that's happening on the riverbed as well. There's lots of wet wipes there. So you can get a tangle of hundreds of pieces of plastic just because a couple of wet wipes caught onto some vegetation and then that caught onto some rope and caught some crisp packets. So it's, you know, there's lots of different types of plastic, different sizes, and it's all having different effects. Yeah, because you hear about wet wipes, you know, mixing with old cooking fat in the sewers and causing these huge fat bergs that block the pipes. But this is the first I've heard of a reef of baby wipes changing the shape of the river. Yeah, so it's something that I think Thames 21, an environmental charity, they do an annual sort of cleanup for these wet wipes. So that's where we get all of these figures from, knowing that there's free tennis courts, etc., in just one day, they got 23,000 wipes just looking at the top sort of few centimetres, not digging deep, just, you know, picking off what you could find just from the very surface. So we know there's a lot out there, but I think it's something where it's not necessarily as well publicised. And as I say, people sometimes think if you flush it down the toilet, there's this magical way that, you know, that the sewage treatment plants will filter it out. But in reality, all it takes is some, not even necessarily heavy rain, maybe just prolonged light rain and the sewage system suddenly has more water than it can process and eventually it goes out of these combined sewage overflows which unfortunately means raw untreated sewage wet wipes sanitary pads anything that's been flushed down the toilet can go directly into the river mm, nice yeah um, we've got a couple of really interesting questions um including one from another khalil which i'm really happy to see um but we're going <laughs> to end because they're really uh they're, i think they're quite big important questions so we'll get to them at the end of the show i think it's time to have a look at the kind of the, the contemporary context because at the moment we're obviously uh 
uh, still in the middle of, of the coronavirus pandemic and the associated lockdown. And that has it's been changing our behavior. You know, we're out and about less. We are getting a lot more stuff sent to us in the post rather than going out to the shops. Uh, people are using a lot of disposable protective equipment like masks and gloves, things like that. So has that changed our, our use of plastic? And, and then has that changed kind of the plastic that gets into the environment? So certainly it has the potential to. Obviously, if there's less people out and about, that means potentially less litter. There's less going down drains in the street. And so it could have a positive effect. It could mean that we're not getting as much directly going into the river. But as you say, we have a lot more delivered to us and we have a lot more in food packaging. I think a lot of us feel safe because if you've got carrots or something in a bag, then it's not anybody handling your carrots, nobody that's potentially contaminated touching your food. Um, but plastic can have COVID living on it for three days. So I think sometimes we choose things for packaging or at present, obviously, we don't always have as much choice. Even if you go to the supermarket, um, what with supply chains being affected, sometimes you can only buy food that's in packaging. So I think definitely there's the chance that we are producing and consuming a lot more plastic. And it's where we've got to be really careful to dispose of it responsibly. And I think that's Not what like this, this picture. Yeah, so I think this image kind of highlights the well-meaning intention, but that sort of not really quite putting two and two together. So this is a, a dustbin that was in a local park near me. And during one of the sunny days, um, obviously you're allowed to go out in small groups uh, to parks if you stay socially distant. And I think a lot of these people took their picnics and thought, I'll put it in this bin. But with so many people, obviously, you know, after potentially months of being at home, everybody, as soon as it's sunny, wants to go out. And there's not as many people out there to clear bins, obviously less staffed because we don't want people being exposed. So people put their rubbish next to the bin and don't really quite um, consider that all it takes is some rain, some wind, you know, and that, that litter could suddenly go from being well-meaningly placed next to the bin to being out in the environment where it will have a negative effect. And so I think it's a and case that we've all got to be really careful that we're responsible with what we use. And looking at those items that were in and on and around that bin, almost all of them contain plastic. Um, even like the paper cups for takeaways and stuff, they're obviously treated with a coating. So plastic is, is everywhere. And your work specifically mainly focuses on the Thames, right? Um, and you've been out there sampling and, and getting uh, peaks of, of what, what the makeup of the plastic in the river is like. Um, how do you go about doing that? So we want to sample every three months. And while we're going out on the boat, what we're after is the fish. We're after the fish, the crabs. We want the animals. As you can see in this, this picture here, this is from a, a previous study. This is a, a fike net. So it's a, a net that sits stationary on the riverbed about knee height and it just collects passively all of the things that are rolling along flowing with the river um, and so we want the animals but unfortunately these nets and the nets that we use the traditional um, commercial fishing nets that we tow behind a boat these aren't just collecting fish like this they are filling with plastic so it's a case of sort of keeping the animals to study the microplastics to look at what they're eating but whilst we've got this sort of information of macroplastics, using that to say, if we've got a lot of crisp packets, are the fragments we see in the fish, could they be from those pieces of plastic or are they from the sanitary pads that we find? And using that to inform those discussions. Um, and we do this every three months. So we want to look at seasonal variations. And that's worked really well for us because it means that we've got one sample just before lockdown, literally a couple of days before London closed, essentially. And then one just a couple of weeks ago, so just as London is reopening. And that way we can have a comparison, both what it was last year compared to this year, but also what effect lockdown might be having. Um, and it might be that we don't see anything now. It might take weeks or months or years for this plastic to suddenly emerge in the environment. And we can suddenly see all of the stuff that you know we've been using and throwing away. So how do you sort through the rubbish? Do you just kind of sort through it by hand? 
for the macro litter, so for the items like these, these large pieces of litter, yeah, it is essentially just me and my phone taking photos of absolutely every individual piece of plastic next to a scale bar saying, this is a white piece of carrier bag, it's 20 centimetres long. Next, this is a piece of a Coke wrapper, it's 10 centimetres, and sort of documenting it like that. Um, so this is all from one day's sampling with those fike nets, those stationary nets on the riverbed. So each of these is just one, one day on the Thames. So, you know, a small portion of what would be there year on year. Um, and you can uh, see are these the main the categories that you get? Yeah, so these are the, sort of the, the big bad culprits in the Thames, really. Um, so we get a lot of food packaging mostly sort of snack packaging actually like crisps and chocolate um though i have also had like pita breads uh which seems a lot weirder to think of somebody going along the the road snacking on a pita bread and getting rid of it than it does it seems much more likely that a crisp packet or chocolate packet is littered um but also cigarette wrappers so a lot of people that um you see them unwrap it and just drop it on the floor similarly cigarette butts if you drop those on the floor they often contain either plastic fibers or sort of artificially made semi-synthetic fibers so they can be a source of pollution as well so um don't always drop your cigarette butts if you can put it in an ashtray or a bin that's much better um sanitary products similarly to wet wipes are flushed down the toilet um and carrier bags as well so these are similarly what we find in in our nets as well so you know there's a lot of um for example, these wet wipes that, are, you know, there's a movement towards marketing a lot of products that are sold as, you know, flushable or biodegradable or, uh, you know, uh, environmentally friendly. How green are these things really? So it really depends on the product, but I think I'd be really wary. So as a person buying a product, really consider just because it says it's compostable, does that mean it's safe for the environment? And I think flushable wet wipes is sort of the really big issue at the moment. It's a really new field. So science isn't necessarily caught up to where it is and knowing exactly what impact it has on the environment. Obviously, we do have these wet white reefs, so we know that they are getting into the environment and having a negative effect. I think compostable means that it either needs to go in your garden waste, depending on if it's um, household compost or whether it's um, industrial compost and if it's industrial compost it needs to be heated to I'm not sure of the exact uh, temperature but it has to be heated quite a lot for it to break up so obviously the Thames which is a, a cold dark river is not the environment for which those were tested and similarly biodegradable if it's in a cold dark place that will slow the process and I think many of these products also release plastics just because the organic components in them break up does not mean that the fibres that are plastic in them go away. Um, and I think flushable is something where just because you can flush it doesn't mean it's a good idea. Technically, I could flush a pen or a, a razor or something down the toilet, but nobody's going to say that that was a good idea for me to do it. So uh, we say that oh, you should only flush the three P's, which is pee, poo and paper. Everything else goes in the bin or consider if you even need to use it. So do you need as many wet wipes? I'm glad that you highlighted that issue of, um, of, kind of the plastic fibers that are left behind when things break down, because yeah, some, someone mentioned that to me and I, I thought that I you know, really wanted to ask you about it, that so, you know, there are things that, yes, they technically break down once they leave our house, they stop being a bag or a wipe or something, but that, that they still release a lot of, uh, fibers, like you said, and, and microplastic pollution. So in your recent samples, what have you, have you noticed any differences between the kind of post and pre lockdown samples? So certainly there was a lot more plastic in July than there was in March. But when we compare this to sort of the year before, the two sort of summer samples, the June, July samples are actually pretty similar. So um, we take samples in the midwater. So for things that are floating in that sort of from the surface to the riverbed and we take samples on the riverbed so right at that muddy level and in that the bottom of the river for every minute that we sample you get on average about four pieces of plastic and that was the same last year so in june as it was this year in july so there might be an increase in plastic it's just that we've not necessarily seen it yet as i say it might take 
a few months for that plastic to leak in or because most of us are at home it hasn't sort of leached out into the environment as much yet but as we return maybe there'll be a, an increase but certainly it does say how much there is in the Thames because we do up to 10 15 minute samples every time we go out and if every minute of that is at about four pieces of plastic then you can see how that would really quickly add up to you know huge amounts of plastic in the Thames. Yeah and it's interesting that we haven't seen a load of you know, masks and gloves and stuff all appearing in your samples in July. But I guess that uh, highlights what you were saying earlier about the roundabout routes that plastic can take into the environment. You know, it's not like you throw something away and then it's immediately suffocating a turtle. You know, it, it can go, even if it goes the conventional route and it goes maybe into landfill or goes, you know, into, into a recycling plant, you know, it could be it could, it could be blown away by wind, carried away by a seagull, washed away by water, even years later could find its way into the environment. I mean, you've found, you've found some pretty retro plastic pollution in your time, haven't you? Yeah, so uh, the two of us sort of star items are both crisp packets. So this is a hula hoops packet. And I don't know if you can make out on your, your screens at home, but there's a best before date next to the sort of hula hoops logo. And that's- 1986. Yes, August 86. So this is over 30 years old. We pulled this out at the end of last year. I think it was December last year. Um, it hasn't necessarily been in the environment for 30 years, but what I think is really astonishing by this and the other Chris packet, which is also about 30 years old, is that both of them are pretty much intact. You can still see that they are Chris packets. And after 30 years, whilst they've broken up a little bit, They've not completely disintegrated as maybe some people expect them to. You know, you kind of get the idea. You hear, you know, the Thames could have 94,000 pieces of plastic floating at its surface, these microplastics. And so you kind of get the impression your crisp packet becomes microplastics very quickly. And in fact, because they take so long to break up, that is why we have so many is that, you know, we're still putting lots of stuff in but it makes almost, for each piece that goes in, you get a lot more at the end with microplastics, but it takes that time and it's there for a very long, once it's in, it's never coming back out essentially. I think this leads us into some really interesting questions we've been getting from some of our viewers. <clears throat> so there's a two-parter here really. Um, Joe has been asking on YouTube what we can do to stop plastic getting into the river. And then Khalil has been asking uh, how we can get it out of the Thames. So let's address that one half at a time. First of all, is it possible to remove plastic pollution from the Thames on a viable scale? Not really. So I think for the Thames, for the ocean, for any of these um, sort of litter removing ideas, whilst there are people that are developing things to sort of skim the surface of the ocean to collect plastic, I think the economic cost of developing these or to implementing them is obviously really high. You've got to have the manpower of somebody fishing in the Thames, for instance, to get this plastic. And secondly, the effect on the environment is probably going to be just as negative and maybe even worse. We can't, for instance, put a net at the end of the river and clean it every day to take plastics out because how would we stop that net from catching fish or from preventing seals from moving. Seals can travel really long distances in just a day. They can go from France to the Thames in a day and, you know, sometimes back again. So if we've got a net at the end of the river, it's going to stop all of those animals making their natural migrations, their natural movements. Uh, and equally, once it's a microplastic, the size of the net means that you would be catching plankton and all of the really important abundant animals that make up the bottom of the food web that really crucial sort of life supporting point and so if you removed any of that you'd have a huge knock-on effect down that food web so i think the second half of that question how do we prevent it getting in that's the really key point because once it's there it's really difficult to remove but stopping it getting there means that there won't be any more getting in and that's when we can see a positive change so if we can't get it out, how can we stop getting it in? So I think, firstly, be really responsible with how you dispose of it. Um, if you have plastic, make sure it goes in the right place. So if you can recycle it, put it in your recycling, make sure it's clean, make sure it's dry so that you're not going to contaminate the recycling that you have with something dirty. So, for instance, 
tin foil can be recycled, but not if it's greasy and it has to be the size of your fist. Anything smaller than that, it won't be sorted out by the machines. And then also consider how much plastic you're using. If we use less plastic or we use alternatives, there's less to be put out into the environment. Our production of plastic increases every year. And so therefore there's just more that can leach in or be polluted. Um, so a really good idea by a University of Toronto trash team. So a great person to follow on Twitter, for instance, um, they do a environmental household waste audit. So you have a bin and you monitor how much waste you produce in a week, for instance, and you can see what your biggest plastic sort of bad guy is. What is the, the plastic that you use all the time that you maybe haven't noticed you're using? Something that's sort of second nature. Maybe it's all those crisp packets or you buy a lot of biscuits. <clears throat> Sorry. And so maybe... If you see those sort of items, you can suddenly start to make changes. You can choose to use reusable alternatives, reusable um, bottles, for instance, and refill with tap water. Uh, London has a lot of its refill stations. So when you're traveling and commuting in London, lots of places will refill bottles or they'll have a refill station you can use. I think that that, that point about reusable alternatives is a really important one because um, Rachel on Facebook has, has raised a valid point, actually, is that a lot of environmentally friendly alternatives to disposable plastics are more expensive because plastics are relatively cheap to produce and we produce so much of them that they can be made quite cheaply. But I guess the answer to that is instead of using environmentally friendlier disposable uh, items, if we use reusable ones, then it might be you have to spend to acquire that thing in the first place. But then over the, over the course of time, you know, it'll it'll end up paying for itself in terms of its benefits. Yeah. So I would say it's one of these issues where obviously it's really it's a shame because it is always more expensive, uh, expensive to get these sort of better products. As you say, plastics are so cheap. It's why not everything is recycled because it's so cheap to just buy virgin brand new plastic that why would you want the recyclable stuff? And that's why there needs to be sort of tax incentives, government policies that sort of encourage companies to use that recycled plastic. Um, but I think if you can afford those alternatives, the more people that buy them, the cheaper they'll be and therefore more people can use them. And I think it's also a case of if you petition your local stores or you petition your local government and say, right, these are all the items that cost this much and these cost this much. What can we do to make this more accessible? And I think a really sort of an easy way of seeing this is in sanitary products. Most sanitary products are plastic, even tampons contain plastic and sanitary pads and they're all single use. And you think how many women use in their lifetime and you can buy reusable, washable versions of those. But they're always way more expensive. If you buy a supermarket own brand disposable, they can be 60p for 10, whereas reusables can be 25 pounds. And over the lifetime of that product, it is cheaper, but it does mean you need have the funds to do this one high cost at the beginning to get that saving long term and i think if we petitioned government and said why do we have so many products that are so bad for the environment when there is an alternative what can you do what incentives can you apply that will mean that that is more available to more people and i think these are the discussions we have and it's the power of your voice as well as the power of your wallet if you spend money on products that aren't plastic people that make those plastic products will have to change to get you to come buy their products again and similarly if you tell government what you want and you say i won't vote for you i'll vote for somebody else because they will do it then obviously that's another powerful uh, way that we can make a change and in terms of the political and economic angle that you're talking about um you know the government already does spend a lot of money on you know tax breaks and subsidies for various industries um, so, you know, if you at home want to go and look up uh, what kind of what kind of industries are being subsidised and and encouraged uh, with with tax incentives and stuff, then if you talk to your local politician, you can then say, well, you know, uh, we're spending lots of money on this, and I don't think that actually that's a good way to spend our money. We should be spending it on uh, sustainable alternatives to plastic in, in disposables and stuff like that. So, you know, yes, times are hard financially for a lot of uh, economies these days but 
we do have money to subsidize a lot of industries. So it's just about where we prioritize, I guess. Yeah, and I think for a lot of governments, they just need to know what it is that you're interested in. They want to know what you care about because obviously for them, there's almost, if you don't speak up, they don't know that that's what you're interested in as well. So they need to know what the people want as well. Um, and Andra has asked on YouTube, are there any like volunteering programs or something that people can get involved with to help out? Yeah, certainly. So if you're in London, Thames 21 is a brilliant uh, charity. They do litter cleans quite regularly. They're just starting up with slightly smaller projects at the moment. Whilst lockdown is easing, you might have seen them. They were in uh, Zac Efron's Netflix documentary. Um, Zach uh, went and cleaned with Thames 21. So that's a, you know, even Zach goes down to the Thames to clean. Um, so they're a really great charity in London that you can get involved with. Um, there's the Great Nerdle Hunt, and that I think is definitely UK wide, if not global. So if you search Great Nerdle Hunt, that's another one that, um, you know, uh, helps you pick up. And it might be that you independently go and do your bit. There's lots of environmental charities. It's a case of just looking in your local area what options there are. And also, if there isn't one in your local area and you've got the time and you really want to do it, maybe you could start one as well because it needs somebody passionate there at the beginning. So maybe that could be you. It's really interesting hearing about <clears throat> how these solutions to, to this kind of problem require you know, yes, they require involvement of people at a grassroots level and, and kind of around about in their local communities and then on an individual level, but also in terms of, you know, companies and governments, everyone needs to act. And that's what makes it such a complex issue, I guess. Yeah, but I think for the first time, it feels like everybody is on board. I mean, obviously, COVID has slightly switched how everybody's looking at different problems. It, it obviously, our safety comes first. So it's not a case of, because of the plastic, you shouldn't use disposable face masks. If that's what you've got available, as long as you dispose of them correctly, you know, and you're safe, that is the priority. But before this, I think it was the first time that, you know, for an issue that actually everybody was involved in, obviously industry has its slightly selfish, um, you know, I want to do this and government will have its own agenda and we'll have what we want to happen. But I think in general, I think with shows like Big Planet that really highlighted the issue, I do feel say that you know it's positive i want everybody to stay positive i don't want everybody to think goodness ninety four thousand pieces of plastic in the thames what are we going to do it is an issue that i think everybody is agreed on that there does need to be a change and so i do think we should be positive that we can keep pushing and this will eventually hopefully get better so how can what what would your recommendations be for uh trying to reduce our plastic output whilst still for example staying safe during the pandemic so I think an easy switch would be to be reusable face masks, for instance. So um, disposable face masks, um, UCL did a study that if you used one in the UK for every every day of the year, after a year, the UK would have produced 66,000 tonnes of face masks, and an additional 57,000 tonnes of uh, packaging that those masks came in. So that's 127,000, 124,000 um, tons of plastic that we would have produced so if you think switching to two or three reusable masks that you just periodically clean would dramatically reduce that waste and that would mean less could get into the environment because unfortunately not everybody is disposing of these appropriately so i think changing to reusables and making sure that if you are using the single use that you put it in a bin or that if there isn't a bin around you put it in your pocket and you take it home until you can put it in a bin um, those are the two sort of PPE ones I'd suggest. Yeah, the other day I was uh, standing outside my house having a coffee in the sunshine and I saw a disposable mask just kind of tumbleweeding past my house. And my instinctive reaction was like, oh no, someone should put that in a bin. But there's no way I'm going to pick that up. That's, I don't know who's worn it, how recently, what their infection status might be. And it's such a shame that, you know, this is medical waste and it's plastic pollution. Um, and yeah, to see it kind of just out and about like a like a crisp packet or a, or a cigarette butt. Yeah, certainly. Obviously, you want to stay safe. So I wouldn't recommend going out and picking up these gloves, not unless you've got the appropriate protective equipment uh, on you to, to do that. So for instance, like Thames 21, 
all have litter pickers and gloves and masks so you will be safe when you're doing it so it's a case of if you're safe and you're comfortable to do it feel free but obviously bare hands do not pick up other people's masks <laughs> so to wrap up if you had a plastic uh, crystal ball um, and you could look into the future, what would your predictions be as to how, how this pandemic is going to have affected our relationship with plastic and the amount of plastic in the environment or the type of plastic in the environment? So I think we're probably going to see an increase in plastic. I think it might not be immediate, but we will probably see this increase. But I also think it's given maybe some companies and some uh, some people sort of a break, this opportunity to sort of go pressure on the plastic issue has reduced so we can increase our production or we can get more people to buy veg that's wrapped in plastic and I think there's a chance that if we let the pressure go that these companies aren't going to change back so whilst we feel safer with them for the moment we've got to make sure that we keep letting people know that whilst this is what we have at present once the pandemic is over once we are safe again that we need to go back to having unwrapped items that we can use so i think it's a case that hopefully whilst short-term plastic might increase long term once we've come to sort of a safe conclusion of this pandemic that we try and go back to having plastic free alternatives well, I think that's a really lovely way to wrap up. Um, if people have any questions about kind of how to reduce their plastic impact or you know, how to navigate the potentially misleading information that we sometimes get about uh, products, uh, what, can they get, get hold of you online somehow? Yeah, so uh, you can follow me on Twitter. So it's just my name, at Alex McGoran, um, and I'm on Twitter. I retweet other scientists and I definitely recommend if you're on social media and you're interested following some of those scientists so Imogen Napa from Plymouth she does a lot of work on microfibers you've got University of Toronto trash team so lots of different people that you can follow and they've all got really interesting projects and they sort of Twitter's a really good way of getting an insight almost behind the scenes of what happens on science and sometimes we ask for your help. So I personally, I don't recognize every piece of litter that comes in our nets. Sometimes we get something that's from India and I just have never seen it. Um, so we'll put out uh, tweets that say, plastic detectives come and tell me what this is. Um, so if you also want to get involved with uh, those sorts of things, follow me on Twitter and you can kind of help me learn what is in the Thames. Well, I think that's a lovely, empowering way to, to wrap up. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, thanks for joining us. It was lovely to chat. Yeah, great. Well, thank you at home as well for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Please do join us again for more Nature Live shows at 12 on Tuesdays and 10.30 on Fridays. Keep an eye on our social media channels for details. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, as well as nhm.ac.uk. Until next time, that was Alex McGoran. I'm Khalil Thurloway, and this has been Nature Live Online. We're really looking forward to seeing you all at the museum sometime soon. Goodbye.